Okay, so we're talking about this idea of spiritual maturity. Let me read you a verse that you may be familiar with. Um, and by the way, this has nothing to do with age, right? It has nothing to do with how old you are. Um, it, it, you, can, you can be whatever age and be uh, in different journeys with your spiritual maturity, all right? So let me read you a verse, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And here's what the author says about spiritual maturity. He says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand, or in some versions it says you're slow, slow to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. And then he lists off of other, a few other things, but he's basically saying, let's move past certain teaching and move towards things that will help a person grow and mature. Let me make a case for why it is that you might want to be spiritually mature. Um, and, and I'm going to, you say, well, it's obvious pastor, but maybe not. So let me, let me kind of make a case for it. So Jesus tells us that he's going to teach all. He wants us to teach all that he commanded. Let me just give you two. These, these, these I know, you know, right? These, we, we even put the word great in front of both of them because they're so important and central to the gospel message. So here's the first one. They came up to Jesus and asked him to sum up the whole law. And then he gave them the great, you might know the word command. He gave them the great command, right? So, so here's, here's what he said. If you're going to ask me to sum up the whole law, this is how I'll sum it up. To love God with your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as who? Yourself. Okay, so love God with my heart, soul, and mind. Love my neighbor as myself. Now listen, if I'm not maturing, if I'm not growing up spiritually, then it's going to be hard for me to truly love God with my heart, soul, and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself. It's going to be very difficult for me to pull that off. Now, what ends up happening is, is that some people, they, they're not obeying that, that all the great, they're, they're not truly loving God the way they're supposed to. They're not truly loving their neighbor the way they're supposed to. And so there's just this difficulty because they are spiritually, what's the word? Immature, right? They're spiritually immature. Now, he gave us another commandment. It's, it's at the end of Matthew, uh, at Matthew 28, he says, he says that we're supposed to make disciples, we're, we're supposed to baptize people, and we're supposed to teach them all that he what? Commanded, right? And we call that the Great Commission. So a spiritually immature person cannot really effectively do either of two of the basic commands. They really can't love God properly. They really don't love their neighbors or self. They're, they really are not uh, winning people to Christ or, or, or seeing people be baptized or teaching people. They're dealing with all kinds of things that are keeping them from spiritual maturity. Now, listen to me on this. You need to know that in this life, you're going to live this life, and then one day you're going to stand before God, and you're going to give an account for this life, not for salvation. Salvation's found through who alone? Christ, right? Through Christ alone. You're not going to stand before God and give an account for why you're going to be led into heaven because the only reason that you're going to be led into heaven is not because of any good works that you've done, but only what Jesus Christ has done, right? And the fact that you've acknowledged him as Lord, acknowledged him as God, asked him to forgive you of your sins. That's how you get into heaven, right? But when a person gets into heaven, their, their, their life is judged and they're rewarded for the life that they lived, right? So think about it. There are people who are still caught up, who are Christian people, still caught up pursuing all kinds of things in this world and in this life that they'll never be able to take with you, right? You're, you're, you're not going to be able to take all the, all, the, all the toys or anything with you. Not, not that you can't have toys, not that you can't use those things. It's just that if that's the priority, if the priority is focused on the things that I have in this life, then one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be rewarded really for not much, in fact, there's two people described in the Bible who stood before God. Well, one hears a phrase that I think we all long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Anybody want to hear that when you get there? Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, the other one, the Bible says that they made it into heaven 
but they literally smelled like smoke. They barely got there, right? It's not a well done, good and faithful servant. It's a person who just barely got in the door. Um, and uh, their life was nothing to be rewarded. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, it says that those things, that the life and, the, and some of the things that they did will be burned away and they'll be tested. And many of those things will not be rewarded at all. So, so you became a Christian. The day you became a Christian, we'll start here. I became a born-again Christian. Now I'm saved because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And then now I'm starting to walk forward and move forward in my journey. We use a, we use a word that, that uh, kind of a big word, I guess, for, for just kind of talking through life, you know, together. Uh, the word is called sanctification. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, what the word means, but it means to be set apart right? So when I become a born-again Christian, now I'm being sanctified. I'm being set apart more and more and more to become in the image of who? Christ, right? I want to be in the image of Christ because now that I'm a born-again Christian, I'm going to start to grow. The things that are part of my life are going to fade away a little bit. And as the Holy Spirit starts to work and to move in my life, I start moving forward in sanctification to become more and more like Christ. So, Let's say that we've talked and had this conversation, and I've, and I've explained to you that your, your spiritual maturity matters. It matters for how you're going to be rewarded at the end of your life. It matters for those who are around you and in your circle, whether or not they get the opportunity to grow spiritually because of your input in your life. It matters to your own spiritual journey. So you say, yes, pastor, I agree. I want to be spiritually mature. So let me give you Imagine, there it is, spiritual maturity is off this way, and I take off running towards spiritual maturity. I'm heading towards becoming more and more like Christ. Well, guess what? There's some traps before you ever get to even starting the process. And some of these traps are sinkholes that have pulled many people down, people who said, I want to be more like Christ. I want to grow closer to Christ. But because of um, these four things... I've been caught. You know what Paul said? He said that the, these things that so easily entangle you. Let me, let me give them to you. So, so the, the first one is dealing with sin. See, sin is simply to miss the mark. That's the actual literal definition. So God has a standard of righteousness. I, I'm aiming towards that. When I miss his standard of righteousness, I sin. And so a Christian knows how to deal with sin. Here's what happens. I do something that I know dishonors God, and I get this incredible gift called conviction. Ever been convicted for how you handled something? You, you said something, you did something, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes on, and he convicts you that, that what you did was not honoring to God. So I'm convicted of my sin. Now I stand before God, and I open up my mouth, and I confess to God that what I did dishonored him and that I asked for his forgiveness, right? That's how I'm dealing with sin. No temptation has seized you except for this common to man. God's faithful. He'll provide a way out. So now I know that the sin in this world that's coming at me in different directions, by the way, we talked about this before. I think there's three sins that Satan's been using since he, since he fell. And these were three sins that he struggled with himself. And, and here they are. Pride? Do you, do you think anyone ever struggles with pride? I, I mean, I, you know, the, the man in the mirror, right? I mean, we, we all struggle sometimes with, with pride. There, there's lust. Lust is to over-desire something. We think of lust more, you know, more associated with sexual temptations, but lust can be to over-desire a lot of different things. And then, of course, greed is to want more money and more, all, more power, more, more position, and you just want more and more and more. You're never content Lust, power, and greed are just some of the sins that God, that, that, that God is trying to help you overcome and that's showing you the way out so that you can overcome and that the enemy is trying to pull you into. Now, if you don't know how to deal with it, then, then those sins can, can start off. And when they're full-blown, the Bible says that when those sins are full-blown, they lead to, to one word. Anybody know that word? Death, right? That's where they lead. So they, they kind of get you going one direction, they pull you more and more, and then eventually it's designed to kill you. And so the kid who was just minding their own business, hanging out with their friends, did not know that inside of them was an addict raging inside. And just, and just for fun, they were playing with their friends, they did some things, they ended up um, smoking weed or they ended up drinking alcohol for the first time. And those things pulled them in 
And now they ended up spending a lifetime fighting off addictions and all the things that come with it. There's another thing that sometimes can be a trap as I'm moving forward. I'm convinced that I want to grow up spiritually because I want to be rewarded when I stand before God. I want to make a difference in the lives of other people and the people who are around me. I want to live a life that's abundant. It's not just sin. Here's a second word. Selfishness. Selfishness. It's interesting. I was introduced on a mission trip for the first time. A group of kids showed me uh, how to use my phone to take a picture of myself. How exciting is that? I, I, never, I never had the ability to take a picture of myself. You guys know what that's called? Selfie. Look at you. You're, you're, you're modern high-tech people, right? So, 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 so I watched as people began taking selfies of themselves. I don't know if you've ever been on someone's maybe an Instagram or, or their Facebook and, and potentially Potentially, and, and I, I'm not saying that there's just one like this. I've seen many like this. The whole thing is entirely pictures of someone's face. Their face eating food, their face or, you know, doing whatever they're doing. And, and it's just, just scrolling down, down, down. Uh, it's just a lot of pictures of themselves. Now, selfies are dumb, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you know it, it's fine that you can kind of take a picture, mark the moment. But, but it seems harmless enough, but it's really not because really what the enemy wants us to do more than anything is to love who? Ourselves, right? He just wants you to love yourself more than you love him and more than you love others. He wants you to put, put you at the center of what's going on. And what ends up happening is, is, is beating selfishness out of our life is very difficult to do, very challenging to do um, because we know that, by the way, Jesus knew this. What did he say? He said, he said, I want you to love your neighbor as who? Yourself. You know why? Because he knew that you loved yourself. If you wanted to argue with Jesus, he said, well, I, I know you love yourself because you feed yourself, you clothe yourself, you take care of yourself, right? I mean, you, I know you're already taking care of the basics. So there is a certain sense of, of focus. Let, let me tell you something. A selfish person, a person who can't get, who can't get beyond what's in it for me, is going to miss out on the joy of growing spiritually. They'll never get there because they're going to constantly be circling back around. And even people approach the church of Jesus Christ who established his church right here. They approach the church. I've seen many people selfishly, right? They approach it as a consumer. What's in it for me? Do I have this? Do I have that? Do my kids have that? Do I like the music? Do I like, the, do I like this, this, and this? And they're working through it. Instead of, instead of focusing on, on some of the things that really matter, like am I going to grow spiritually here? Am I going to be able to use my spiritual gifts to make an impact here, right? And so some of the things just are, are we're blinded by our own selfishness. And, and, and so that, that's another trap. The enemy, a person who wants to grow spiritually, they're moving forward, but, but they have a sin that comes into their life and they, and they don't know how to overcome it. By the way, some sins, the way to overcome them is for you to go to someone you love and to confess, I am struggling with this particular sin. I really am struggling. My, my, my heart is being pulled in this direction and I know that it's not what God has for me and I'm really struggling and I need somebody to help me, come alongside me and hold me accountable. So there's dealing with sin, there's the overcoming selfishness. There's also an understanding that the enemy actually is designing a scheme against you so that your life will not matter. That's really what he wants. He wants to make sure that your life doesn't matter, that no one around you is influenced or impacted for the better, that people don't feel loved by you, people don't feel supported by you, that you go through your life and your life doesn't matter. Now watch this, the scheme is very tricky because in Ephesians 6, he says he lays out a scheme for you. He lays out a scheme for me, but it may not be packaged like sin. Let me give an example. One of my favorite things for entertainment purposes is to watch sports. I, I, like, I like all kinds of sports. I, I found myself in the Olympics watching them kind of do a shuffleboard. And I was like, this is exciting, right? You know, I, I like all kinds of sports. Do you know what a three-sport athlete is? Do you know, do you know what that is? It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the, you, should, you could follow the name, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. So, 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 well, not a triathlon. We're not going to get crazy here. But anyway, so, so uh, a three-sport athlete is someone who, who plays every year all three sports. 
major sports. And they can do different things, but basically the three sports that you kind of play in, a, in America uh, would be, of course, football. F- football, by the way, is very American. And I, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not talking soccer, right? Yeah, football, right? So football, baseball, and, and basketball, right? These would be three of the big ones. Of course, kids are playing soccer, lacrosse, all this stuff. Do you know how much time it takes to play a sport? It takes a lot of time. In fact, if you're in season, you practice every day. The minimal practice, because I'm a chaplain for a number of teams, the minimal practice is two hours. Sometimes it's two and a half hours, but two hours, minimal practice every day, five days a week. On the day that you're not practicing, the only reason that you're not practicing is because you're going where? To a game, right? It's game day. And so now you're going to go to a game. You may go off campus, all the sort of things. It is not a sin to play sports. And let me make this very clear. It is certainly not a sin to watch sports. I've talked to the Lord about this. It's not, and so it's not a sin to play sports, not a sin, a sin to watch sports. But let, let me ask you this. Could, could Satan come in and have someone so focused on, on, a, on a game that they have no chance of making an impact? Could he? And, and then, they're, then they're not, they don't even feel massive conviction because they're not even thinking about the fact that this scheme has come in. We had a young man, as the youth group at Seminole First Baptist Church began to grow, and it went from, a, 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 well, it went from one, I had one night that we had one, uh, to eventually 80 kids, a fully diverse youth group, half black, half white, and Sergio, uh, representing all Hispanics, right? Um, as this youth group began to grow, one of the major leaders in the youth group was a young kid who many believed would play Division I baseball at Seminole High School. But because he was so good, they wanted to make sure that he played baseball. Are you ready? Baseball alone. He wasn't, he, in fact, he was forbidden by his coaches to play any other sport, to play baseball alone year-round. So he played his season, then he joined a travel team, and then he had all these different things. Year-round baseball was going on, and he missed church about 50% of the time. Well, one day on, on the baseball field, he was injured, and, and he was injured in a major way. In fact, he was told by his doctors, you'll probably not play high school baseball again, and you'll certainly never play at the biggest level. And, and he shared that with us, and we said, well, I'm sorry. He said, you know what I think I, I'm going to do? I'm going to take all the time that I spent playing baseball, and I'm going to dedicate it to ministry. And you know that while he did that, God called him into the ministry and God used him in an incredible way to win all kinds of people to Christ and to make a huge impact. But the fact of the matter is well, he did not know that his potential was being thwarted by the enemy by being too involved in something that was good but not great, right? So, something that, that, that worked for the moment but was not the call for the long haul. So, so those schemes that the enemy... Then, of course, the other one is just a lack of commitment to studying and applying the Word of God to your life. See, some people are crazy enough to believe this. If I don't study the Word of God and I don't know more, then when I get to heaven, I won't be held accountable for the fact that I disobeyed the Word. Because then I, what I'll say to them is I'll say, hey, I didn't know. So that would be the equivalent of you just starting to drive your car, not going down and getting a driver's test, not learning what all the signals are for, not learning about yield and yellow and red and green and all the Christmas cut, not learning about any of that, and just driving freely the way you want to. And when you get pulled over by the police officer, uh, you have no driver's license, you violated laws, and, and then all you have to say to them is, is listen, I, I want you to understand something. I've never studied for the test the only reason that I'm running stop signs, the only reason that I'm running red lights is I've never studied. So I was wondering if you could let me off. Well, most likely without your driver's license and with, depending on what your crime was, uh, he might give you a ride in his car, right? Uh, and, and so, so you, you get, because it doesn't matter that you thought everything was cool because you hadn't studied your test. You're still going to be held accountable. Same thing for, for you and I. But if I'm studying the word of God, guess what the word of God's doing for me? It's not trapping me or making my life smaller. In fact, the truth is setting me free, right? It's setting me free. The more I know how to speak, how to live, how to act, how to love, the more freedom that I'm experiencing in my life, the more joy that I find in my life, the more peace, the more patience, kindness, goodness, all the fruits of the Spirit working in and through my life. Now, those are just, by the way, 
Those are just the traps on your way to spiritual maturity. And some people have never even made it to the other things I'm talking about because they came to know Jesus Christ. They saw someone make a case for you need to grow up spiritually. You need to become the person God's called you to be. They started taking off to pursue spiritual maturity, to pursue spiritual growth. And they got caught up in sin, in schemes, in selfishness, and a lack of commitment to God's word. And it kept them from ever even having a chance. Now, now some have learned how to navigate, how to deal with their sin, how, how, to, how to discern the schemes of the enemy. They've learned that, that the selfishness inside of them needs to be built, beat down so that I can go from living, they rhyme, by the way, instead of living a selfish life, I can live a selfless life. So it's not about me anymore. And, and I understand that it's not about me anymore. So, so what do I do if I, wanna, if I really want to grow spiritually? What do I do? And I'm going to give you some, some words here on this whiteboard. Now, let, let, let's just do this early, okay? I could, if given enough time, write this on this board in a way that will look a little more normal. But we don't have that kind of time. So I'm going to put the word up there, and you're going to go, I'm not sure, and I will interpret it for you, all right? Uh, so that's, that's how we're going to play this. And So I don't want anybody helping me or, you know, I, I, when I do this with middle school kids, they just mock me, and they're like, that's not a, really a word. I'm like, it really is a word. So just trust me, all right? So here, here's the first word, and Pastor Frank kind of talked about it last week, uh, the idea of church, right? So I'm going to put church right here. Look, look what it says right here. Uh, and the, the point is become an active participant in a local church. I want to read you Hebrews chapter 10, talking about believers getting together and believers working together. Starting in verse 23, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So as we get closer and closer to the Lord's return, which we are, we, 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 we don't neglect the idea of us getting together and spending time together. We're part, of a, we're part of a church family. I don't know that I'll ever get over what happened after COVID. I don't know that I'll ever understand that particular thing. Um, especially the statistics that people don't talk about very much. I, I wish I had the exact number, but I think, it, I think it's right around 30% of people who were actively involved in their church when they walked out the door of March of 2020 never returned to their church. Is that, does that not just blow your mind? To think about people living their life in, co in community and in fellowship and, and years of Sunday school and watching each other's kids get baptized and attending weddings and, and funerals saying goodbye and then 30% just never came back do you, do you know what the biggest group that didn't come back? This, 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 is, this will get you. It is not young people. It is certainly not college-age people. Neither one of those were, had a massive drop-off in attendance. You know who didn't come back? Boomers, 55 to 70. What in the world? People who have been part of the church, because here's what happened was they just started looking at, you know, watching on TV, and then they had other things to do, and they had, had other places to be. And, they, and here, here's what the thought was. We've already served our time. We've already volunteered in the nursery. We've already helped a lot of different people. We've been there, and, uh, and there's really not too much more for us to have to do. We don't have to engage like this anymore. And so they just, they just didn't come back. They watched it on TV, they watched it on a Facebook or a YouTube, uh, but they didn't participate as active members in a church. Now, now we, we, I'll tell you, we're, we're going to go someplace here, right here in a few minutes, uh, that, to show you that there's something that we're hoping is going to pivot in our church. So we, we don't want to just, we don't want to play church, we don't want to just keep doing the same things over and over again. Uh, expecting different results. We want, to, we want to be very careful how we go about moving to the next thing. So here, here's the next word, right? You got, you got the idea of church. And then this is, I'm going to use the word just so that they all start with C. 
um, which is always fun, right? So, so, so I'm going to use this word, and it's celebrations, right? But really what I'm talking about is um, worship. I'll put worship right here, right? I'm talking about worship services like you're in, where we end up singing songs, we end up getting into the Word, we end up spending time together. Um, Ephesians 5 talks about this idea of, of what needs to be happening uh, when we come together. Let me, let me read it to you. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. It says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body, uh, which is the head. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love so each part does its work. That is a wonderful scripture, and, but it is not the one. So here we go. By the way, wonderful scripture. I, there you go, free of charge. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just going to say this to you. If, in fact, you, you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with him, then every component of a worship service should be encouraging. When you hear people singing and worshiping the Lord, when you hear someone uh, sharing and explaining God's word, when we're, when we're worshiping the Lord through our giving or maybe we're having a time of remembering and communion, the idea of being with God's people ex should be an excitement to you. Now, I can tell you this, um, and, and Missy knows that this has kind of been my habit and we've worked together on this and, and tried to make this happen. I don't miss church. So if I'm not with you, I'm, I'm either preaching at another church. If I'm not preaching at another church, then I am in the audience at a church. You say, well, pastor, can you take off a week of church? Can you, can you, can you skip a week? Sure you can. Um, I was with some business guys in, in, in Channel Side the other night, and uh, I heard the guy talking to him. He said, hey, I go to such and such a church. He said, that's great. I do go to that church too. What, what service do you go to? He says, well, I go to the second service. He goes, I go to the second service. He says, I'm the greeter at that door. He says, I haven't seen you. He said, well, I do attend the church. He says, it's, you know, it's been, you know, it's not as often as it used to be. So I just had to, right? I said, well, how, how often is it? And he said, well, he said, I, I think I get to church uh, once a month. And so I thought, well, you know what? Why not just go all in? I said, so I said, so, so you, it's not whether or not you attend the first service or the second service, it's what Sunday you attend. So you're a first Sunday attender. He said, uh, he said, listening to you say it like that sounds really bad. I'm like, well, it is pretty bad. So, I mean, so you're saying that you're a member of a church, you're, but you're there for the first Sunday, right? But, but how can we celebrate? This is, we go through this, this time of the year every summer, right? Where, where, where we have all of our winter residents gone and people traveling and stuff. And we have a smaller crowd. But we can still get together. We can sing. We can celebrate. We can spend time in God's Word. But the more of us that are together, the more exciting it is. It really is. The more people I see who love Jesus, who are coming together, the more, the better. You say, well, Pastor, I like a small church. That's fine. Well, but... but I hope you're encouraged by other believers. I hope you're encouraged by seeing other people. So this idea of a celebration. The third thing is this. We look for ways, and let me read number two to you again. Celebrate with other believers in a large group setting, a place where you'll spend time honoring God through worship and the study of his word. Number three, look for ways to connect with others in a meaningful relationship that's designed to help people come into a direct encounter with Christ. Now, this is where I want to I want to help you with this one, because this one, this one's pretty big. And the next one is going to be stepping on your toes. I just want to kind of prepare you just a little bit for what happens next. All right. So so this one right here is this idea of connection. Right. OK, so for us, we have a few things that we do to connect. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you three things. Right. We have um, I, I'm going to use the first letter so I can kind of get through and you can kind of you can follow me. All right. So we have. Um, uh, ministries that we that we that we conduct. We have Bible studies 
and we have events, okay? So an event's like a vacation Bible school or some kind of special event. Uh, maybe you might have be, you participate in Sunday school, a Bible study, or maybe we have a celebrate recovery or some other kind of ministry, a youth ministry, a children's ministry. And this is where we're connecting with people, right? Now, I'm going to read you a verse I've read to you two or three times during this series and I, and I want you to kind of embrace a little bit of what Paul's saying uh, in 1 Thessalonians. This is Paul talking about how he was going about doing ministries. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, listen, listen to what he says about the kind of ministry that he's doing. 2 verse 8. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So, now this, this, is the, this is the pivot. This is the change that we're looking for as a church, and we're already seeing this happening. Right now, folks, this is the end game for us. We, we want people, we, when it comes to a, a Southern Baptist church, we want people to value membership and join the church. Then when they do join the church, we want them to be active in worship and with other, other Christians. And then, and then we want them to connect with somebody in, in a Bible study or in a, a, an event or possibly a ministry. But we're missing the main thing. See, because the reality is all those things can happen. You can do all three of these things and not become spiritually mature. In fact, <clears throat> I know some people, and I've got pretty good church attendance. I know some people who have equally good church attendance. They, they've been a member of a church, some of you in this room, for, for a long time. You, you don't miss worship, right? This section over here, y'all are going to win a prize. I'm going to give out Chick-fil-A cards. So y'all say, y'all are y'all, y'all there Stand strong uh, and, and, and covering that spot. It's great. So, so there's people who are not mission worship. I can look around, and, and, and you guys on the back row, too. I, I, there's many of you, many of you. I, I want to I congratulate all of you who are attending regularly. I, you know, I, I didn't want to, okay, I, I didn't want a section to be empty next week. He doesn't even know we're here. Right. All right. So, celebration, connection. Do you know that almost 90% of the people who come into a worship service at Legacy also go to Sunday school? Isn't that wild? To think of, so so the, the bulk of the people in our church are connected in some way. Now, let me read you from 1 Peter chapter 1. Because there's another word, and it's going to be interesting. Because this word right here is what really changes everything when it comes to the, the pursuit of spiritual maturity. 1 Peter 1 Verse 13 through 18, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now here's the word. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the facts about this particular word. And some of you will avoid some of this for the rest of your life. Because you, because you will not allow what has to happen next to happen. And here's the word. To conform to the image of Christ. What, what, it, what it means when I say conform to the image of Christ, what I'm saying is, is that I don't make Christ into my image. I don't sit there and go, well, I want to do this, this, and this, and I want Jesus to be the biggest percentage of my life. Um, I don't do it that way. What, what I do is I say, wait a second, you are God and you made me. You're God and you are the one who determines the days that I'm here on this earth. You're the one who gives me a calling, who opens up doors. You are sovereign and over me and in authority over me because I'm not my own anymore. I've been bought with a price. I belong to God and his son, Jesus Christ. And so here I am in a situation 
where now I need to conform the life that I'm living to match up with what it is that God wants me to do. And guess what's going to happen? You can avoid this in Sunday school. You can go to Sunday school and learn more. You can be educated more. But you can avoid this issue of conforming because guess what happens to be able to really help someone conform into the image of Christ? You have to sit down, you have to look them in the eye, and you have to ask them some questions. Like, how's your time in God's Word? How, how are you doing when it comes to your thought life? Are you living a life that is that's, that's holy and honoring to God? Uh, how, how's it going with your, your relationships? Or are the people around you being, uh, being loved the way that God would want them? And you just walk through a list of discussions. But let me tell you, there are many Christians who on the first two or three questions would say this. I got, I got, to, Paul, I got to ask you to stop for just one second, right? This is what they would tell you. I got to ask you to stop for just one second because I'm not trying to offend you, but really this is none of your business. <laughs> it is, this is really not your business. But see, if I am part of the body of Christ and we're all connected together, then the way that you're living your life is very much my business. Not as your pastor, but as another Christian who is spurring each other on towards love and good deeds. So, so here I am in this situation. Now watch this. If I really want to be spiritually mature, yes, I deal with all of the different pitfalls. I deal with all of them. And here's what I really do, right? I make sure that I am a part of a church, that I regularly am with God's people to celebrate and worship and in the Word. I am in a connection group. I am in some place where people know me and I'm doing life together and I'm being educated spiritually, all those kind of things. But when I walk in to the room. Watch this. By the way, this, this will change your whole life if you, if, you, if, you, if you catch this one point. When I walk into a room, I'm looking around to see who God wants to connect me with. So I'm in the room and I say, you know, God, who am I, gonna, who am I supposed to share my life with? Not just preach the gospel, right? But to share my life. Who am I supposed to do that with? Now, I ask you this, when, when, when this happens, you need to know something, that sharing your life with someone else changes everything. It takes time, it takes commitment, it, it takes this journey of just walking through, but I promise you this, it also brings you the most joy. When, when, when Missy and I came here to, to this town, April 1st, 2010, April 1st, 2010, one of my friends asked me, because I was the head of the Youth for Christ in Atlanta. I was very, very active in the church. I was doing all kinds of different ministries there. He asked me the question. He said, you know, between you and your dad, I feel like you guys kind of know everybody here. He said, I just want to ask you one question. How many people do you know in St. Pete? I said, well, I know one. And he's the pastor of the church that I agreed to pastor with. He said, well, what about his wife? I said, I never met her. It'd be the first time. So you're moving to Pinellas County, and you know one person. And they said, we need to do an intervention. You, you've lost your mind. You, you have absolutely lost your mind. You know, you got everybody here supporting you, your family, your mother, your father, your cousins, your nieces, your nephews, all your church partner friends, all kinds of pastors who know and love you. And you are moving to a county where you know one person. Now that one person treated me right. He took me to Harvey's for my very first meal. Um, and uh, it was exciting. I think it was that year that I discovered that I had diabetes, but not before I was able to eat that key lime pie, right? And so uh, it was great. I started doing something. I, I started every time that I was around a group of people. I know I can't be that for everybody. I mean, I can't. There's no way for me to be someone who, who totally shares my life with every single person that I meet. But well, one thing that I did know was that ministry leaders and pastors in particular seem to be struggling and going through things. And, and I got a real heart for pastors. Um, my dad's a pastor. I, I'm a pastor. Three of my kids pastor, do ministry, and serve other people. So here's what I used to do when I would, when I would meet somebody and talk to someone. I would ask them this question. I'd say, hey, um, by the way, this is great for you. What's, what's your name? 
What's your name? I, I'm so-and-so. What church are you at? Well, I'm, I'm pastor in such and such a church. Um, do you like lunch? And by the way, every Baptist pra- pastor likes lunch and breakfast for that matter. And dinner, hallelujah. I mean, I, I mean, it's just a full revival, right? It's the whole deal. And, and, I, and then I would say those magic words that just, just would ring true. Brother, if you want to get together and have lunch, I'd be happy to buy. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah. So you're going to buy me some food, right? It's interesting to watch uh, Baptist preachers get that excited about food as if they never had a meal of their own, right? You know, or, or can't, can't afford to get some bread and butter and stuff together. And I, anyway, um, everything changed. Everything changed. I, I know more people in this county than I ever did in Atlanta, really. I know all kinds of pastors. I know all kinds of ministry leaders. I know all kinds of people who, if, they, if you walked up and, they, and you mentioned my name to them, they would say, that's a very, this is what they would say, that's a very good friend of mine. Very good friend. Now, now what, what, what is it that happened in, in that process? I just walked into some rooms and saw some people that I understood. And I saw what they were going through and some of the challenges that they were going through. And I did this. Are you ready? I walked across the room. By the way, you start walking across the room, you start building a relationship and connecting, it could change. Everything could change. And everything could change for the better. I'll close with this. I um, have had many relationships where even at the beginning of the relationship, God, convic- God showed me, I want you to do this, but know this, if you do it, everything changes. Everything. Everything. Your, your whole life will be different because of this one encounter. You know what I've found about people? They're very messy. Very messy. Like you, you get into it and you hear their story, you're like, man, that is, uh, wow. Right? But, but uh, by the way, I'm not only a, I'm not only a pastor, but, but I'm a people. I, I, I'm, I'm a person, right? I, 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 I get it. And, and, and the things that, that I've seen and some of the things I've gone through, I, you know, they're, they're messy. Not, not super easy to kind of navigate some of the things that you go through in life. Now, I'm going to show you, and in in, I haven't picked the exact venue, but the Lord's definitely put it on my heart that not only are we going to move into this discipleship mode, this is where disciple making is going to happen in this conformity. We're going to do that. I believe that we're going to be discipling all kinds of people uh, by, by the fall. I, I, we're already, we got people, a number of people who are already in a discipleship relationship, and we're going to move into that in the fall. But hear me on this, and then we'll, then we'll close out with a song. Some of you, you could, I mean, you could do this discipling. You could help somebody. You could be discipled yourself. You could, and we want to encourage you to do it. But the Lord really showed me that there's some people in our church who honestly the enemy has, has, has spoken into to their ear. You're done. There's nothing else for you. You don't have the physical strength to do it. You don't have the ability to do it. You're not as, as, as capable as you once were. And, and you're done. Now all you need to do is just kind of run it out. Now, now listen, I'll show you what, what I'm talking about. But I believe that the Lord's shown me a plan for someone sitting in their recliner to make a massive impact in the lives of a lot of people. I'm going to show you what, what it looks like because it's honestly, I think that it's going to have a ripple effect where people can just follow two or three very basic ideas. By the way, if you're capable and you're physically able to keep doing different things, let's not have a recliner ministry. But when you get there, this is what you'll do, right? And it really involves prayer. It involves encouraging people. It involves connecting with people that, that listen, I'm going to say this. My, my aunt can see this, uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so, so my dad's older brother has three children. They also have a number of children of their own. They are, are you ready? My first cousins. My first cousins. They're not my third or fifth cousins. And I think I was nine the last time I saw them. Last time I saw them in person. 
It's just life started happening. I just, just they, they started going, we started going, our families didn't get together as much. How many family members do we have out there that it, it would almost be like walking across the room and say, hey, it's me, Drew, I'm your first cousin. How you doing? <laughs> how, are, how are things going, right? Uh, and they say, well, it's awesome, and you're 54 now? Yes, yeah, missed you these last 40 years. Uh, and, 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 and now think about this for a minute. If in my recliner I could connect again to all kinds of family, I could figure out what their birthdays were, I could begin praying for them, I could be thinking about, it. and then from my recliner I could literally, watch this, pick up a piece of paper, like a little card, I could go buy these cards and have a card and I could literally write on someone's birthday a handwritten note. I just, man, I got to tell you something. I miss a lot of things about my papa and nana, but that's the thing I miss the most. Just, just a handwritten note, a birthday card. Do you, do you, we don't do this anymore, really, right? I mean, every once in a while you send a handwritten note. Now, if I sent you a handwritten note, I would also put my phone number down so I can interpret what it said, right? Uh, you know, you could kind of, do, do you know how life-changing it might could be for people? I, I could read you text message after text message, not only just me, but of other pastors who, had a, who took a text message and sent it to me. And here's what it says in the text message. You, you got me at just the right time. I was so discouraged and you send in this message to me. Imagine from your recliner, connecting with family, praying for church people. This morning as I was praying for church people, I was sending them text and tell them, hey, I pray for this, pray for that. Just encourage you just to say something. You can do that. You can as long as everything's kind of together, uh, you know, you can kind of pull it and say, God, whatever it is that you want to do through me, I, I want to st still be used until I'm not here anymore, right? So, if you're under the age of 40, beware, because it's going to start, it's going to start for you first, and, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then it's going to trickle all the way through the whole church. You are going to have someone walk up to you at some point in the, next, in, in the next few months and ask you if you'd like to be discipled. And beware, beware. When they ask you if you would like to be discipled, what they're asking you is if you would like to become more like Christ. That's the question. Do you want to be more like Christ? And do you want to conform into his image? Do you want to be who it is? Now, d d if you're under 40, you guys thought you got away with something. We're coming for you too, Right? And, and the idea would be just, just this mobilization of discipleship and accountability and helping people become all that Christ wants them to become. 